Does it matter if the Colorado case that led the Supreme Court to legalize some discrimination, does it matter if it was based on a fabrication? There's hardly anything ever black and white in the law. There is a pile of cash waiting for cities and towns who agree to build more affordable housing, yet only four small communities have opted in. Celebrate America indoors tomorrow afternoon because severe weather is expected in the metro area. And we look at the reason why fewer people are hiking Colorado's most popular 14ers tonight on Next. Your questions have us returning to the Supreme Court decision to allow Lori Smith, a website designer in Colorado, to legally discriminate against some same-sex couples. So how did a hypothetical situation go all the way to the Supreme Court? And didn't the justices just rule on a similar case involving a baker in Colorado? Here's Marshall Zellinger. Twice now, the United States Supreme Court has ruled on Colorado businesses seeking to discriminate. On Friday, the conservative justices ruled that Lori Smith can legally tell same-sex couples she will not design their wedding websites. In 2018, the Supreme Court also ruled on a case involving Masterpiece Cake Shop and Baker Jack Phillips not wanting to design a same-sex wedding cake. The issue that people believe was addressed in uh, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case I was largely sidestepped by the Supreme Court. Attorney Liz DeLay helped explain that the cake shop case did not really set a precedent. That ruling found that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission was hostile toward Phillips's religious beliefs. The ruling did not allow for businesses to blatantly discriminate. I think it's um, very reasonable to be confused um, given the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. Smith, who wanted to design wedding websites, preemptively went to court because she did not want Colorado's anti-discrimination Act to force her to design a wedding website for a same-sex couple against her religious beliefs. The courts took her case, even though she had not received and denied a request from a same-sex couple. I do think there's a big question of what then is the injury? Before the case was argued in front of the Supreme Court, Smith interviewed with the New York Times. Some of that audio was played on the Daily Podcast earlier today. Rather than wait to be punished, I decided to take a stand to protect my First Amendment rights. And I shouldn't have to be punished before I challenge an unjust law. Essentially what the court found was that um, she had filed for an injunctive relief, which requires only proving that there be a credible threat, uh, that the, uh, the state would seek action against her under the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act should she create a website and then not offer those same services to same-sex couples. Despite this ruling, Colorado's Anti-Discrimination Act is still a thing. If you're a public-facing business, meaning a business that takes money for services, your reason to discriminate against someone has to be more than, because I don't want to. If you have religious reasons, the courts have opened up the path to challenge over other creative services, things like t-shirt design and tattoos were a couple examples that Liz DeLay gave me. There have been a bunch of articles kind of in the last couple of days suggesting that some of the evidence in this case was fabricated. That at one point, Lori Smith said, this this gay couple came to me for a website. This is what I'm worried about. Now the guy who supposedly was involved in that said, I'm a straight guy. I didn't ask you for it. Straight guy didn't do it. Does it it matter? Uh, Well, this original complaint had no bearing of anybody asking. And she even admitted in that audio, why should I wait for that for me to bring it to the courts? So... Clearly, no. The courts had every opportunity to say your original complaint had no actual request of you to do this. So come back when you have that. So now that that path's been open, I, I want to give a political example. We people collecting signatures to get on a ballot. What if you don't live in that district, but you don't want that person to qualify for the ballot? Can you live anywhere in the state and be like, hey, we should challenge some of those signatures, even though I have no standing to say so, because this case said you don't have to have standing to get involved. I, I don't, someone's going to have to take that case. Yeah, the, yeah the, court, the court had already decided that she had standing to have this issue examined before this supposed couple came along. All right, Marshall, thank you very much. Local governments have a few months to decide if they want affordable housing funding from the state with the strings attached to it. Prop 123, passed by voters last November, sets aside taxpayer money for housing programs. Local governments and nonprofits can use it to buy land or provide assistance to renters and home buyers. Now, some of that funding starts flowing out this month. Governments have until November 1st to commit to whether they will increase affordable housing and fast track permitting those projects through the year 2026. At this point, only four relatively small jurisdictions are on board. Salida, Sheridan, Hayden, and Rangeley. 
nonprofits are really looking forward to working with local governments if they do choose to opt in because they can then use those dollars for things like permanent supportive housing or longer term housing development. Um, but if the local government doesn't opt in, nonprofits should still plan to access these funds to make sure that they're addressing the crisis of homelessness. This is your money that we're talking about. The program's funded by 0.1% of the state's taxable income. It's about $290 million per year. The San Luis Valley is dry, only averages about eight inches of rainfall a year. After a plan to pump water from the valley up to Douglas County failed, leaders in southern Colorado are now trying to head off another water grab. The idea is an agreement that would protect the water in six counties, Alamosa, Sawatch, Costilla, Conejo, Mineral, and Rio Grande. Proposals to export water out of those valley counties would be reviewed by a board that represents all six of them. The plan relies on a 50-year-old state law that allows local governments to regulate things like water systems. The six counties put together the first draft of their agreement last month, got some legal advice on it, made some tweaks, then they're going to put out a second draft next week. Hey, may I make a recommendation? Something that uh, is not our work, but I do think is worth your time. It's also about water in the West. Tribes must be involved. They have to be involved at the very beginning at the very beginning, not after decisions have been made and those decisions being forced upon tribes. Sharon Eusen is a Colorado-based climate and policy reporter for The Hill. She wrote recently about the role of tribes in negotiations over the Colorado River. 11 of the 30 tribes in the Colorado River Basin have unresolved water rights claims. Once those are sorted out, tribal water rights could represent as much as 29% of the Colorado River's annual water supply. And tribal representatives want more seats at the table. We can't sustain that drying system unless we kind of all collaborate together and focus on these creative solutions in which different communities that might not usually work together uh, try to in the future. Udison's article in The Hill looks at how a sovereign approach to water negotiations might work and how tribal knowledge on water conservation might be useful to everyone. We've put a link to that full article in the next section of 9news.com. Three years after the social justice protests of 2020, the Denver Public Library is still working through some tough aspects of its own history, including whether the people honored with library branch names in the past still deserve that honor today. Take the Ross Barnum branch in the Barnum neighborhood. Well, the Ross Barnum branch has been in this neighborhood since 1954, so it's been a community hub for quite some time. It is named after Frederick Ross, who was a businessman here in Denver and a philanthropist, and is also named after Barnum, after P.T. Barnum. Erica R. Martinez, I am the Director of Communications and Community Engagement with the Denver Public Library. Because we are community hubs, it is very important for a library system to really understand and engage with the community to better serve them. How this all started was uh, during the time of uh, racial reckoning. When we as a nation were watching the George Floyd situation unfold, I think it really caused us to pause. And that really prompted us to think about our own spaces and the names that, that are on those buildings. The P.T. Barnum research really created us to pause and to think about his history and his impact. And that's when really we started to think about the possibility of renaming this. History says that he leased an African-American woman and charged money for people to see her. He was able to exploit this African-American woman and benefited from that exploitation. We didn't want to come from a place of erasing history. Um, we want to make sure that we are thoughtful about how we do this. And if we do move forward with renaming it, how can we utilize this as an opportunity to educate the community about that history? Because we want to make sure that people understand that history so that it doesn't repeat. The library sent out a survey last month, and they'll be considering the community's feedback on whether to rename that branch or not. As kids enjoy the summer camp season, thank you for what you have done to make that an experience for everyone. Last week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign raised more than $17,000 for the nonprofit Imagine. They run a summer camp for kids with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Through your 159 straight weeks of giving, you have raised more than $11 million for Colorado's nonprofits. If you know of a great nonprofit that could use our help, I read each and every email you send to next at 9news.com.
Obviously, the, the local governments are, are feeling the pressure. The not so obvious reason that fewer people are hiking Colorado's 14ers. Very smart hail question from one of you, given the forecast for tomorrow afternoon. Does small hail mean the big hail is coming or that it'll just be the small stuff? And an effort to get kids out of trouble and into the gym. Next. A next viewer with an eye for detail, Deb Corbin's her name, recently noticed either the best or the worst closed captioning mistake we have ever seen. Meteorologist Chris Bianchi was out reporting from the scene of the tornado in Highlands Ranch with his name closed captioned on the screen as Crispy Donkey. This is especially unfortunate because closed captioning is official. So that is his actual name now. So for the first time since then, I bring you meteorologist Crispy Donkey. There you are. Thank you. That, oh my gosh, that is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. I was cracking up so hard when we first got that email, Kyle. <laughs> I think you and Steve Stager posted that on social media, and I was crying laughing when I saw it. I, I've, I've seen some bad closed captioning mistakes before. I don't know that I've ever seen one that was that delicious. So, yeah, you now, you now are a crispy donkey for the remainder of your, your time on Earth. Congrats, man. Thank you. I appreciate that, and I will own it. By the way, Kyle? Less than four months till Halloween. Just, just oh, that. oh, get that costume ready, Crispy Donkey. I'm just saying that. Right. But uh, in the meantime, uh, of course, tomorrow, a high impact weather day. It looks like for the front range. And right now, it looks like we're seeing a few showers popping on up. This is a little thunder shower out here near Fort Collins. This one not doing a whole lot at this point. And tonight, not a whole lot of action for us here statewide. Just a few isolated showers and storms for us. And most of those concentrate here into northern parts of Larimer and Weld counties. A little bit of lightning with this. Might want to head on inside out there by Grover and northern Weld County. Otherwise, here, folks, again, quick shower possible. But tomorrow, different story. Unfortunately, we're going to be looking at that threat for some large hail. And these are not just your typical afternoon Colorado showers and storms. It's multiple waves of potentially large hail and flash flooding. Those storms initially develop from 12 to 3, but we'll have storms basically all day long. So, large hail, flash flooding, those are our main concerns. Large hail will be our concern initially, then into the evening to be more of a flash flood threat. But the basic overview here, folks, it looks like a high impact weather day for us tomorrow. So, again, first showers and storms develop early to mid afternoon. Then we get another wave of showers and storms around 6 o'clock. Then perhaps another wave of storms later on into the evening. So, it just looks like a stormy day with, again, large hail and damaging winds possible as well as flash flooding then that seven day forecast cool for wednesday and then we warm back up again as we get into your thursday and friday but kyle again all eyes on this fourth of july forecast which it just looks lousy yeah well there's been lots of warning and there have been a lot of very closely watched weather decisions made by you know groups that are gathering people in public spaces i mean you know one of the great traditions in our city is the park hill fourth of july parade and it's supposed to step off tomorrow right into the midst of that so be watching to see what they what they do there hey while we got you i got a next question from a viewer for you uh ryan wrote in to ask if small hail is a good sign that bigger hail isn't coming or if it's just a warning that the big stuff's going to arrive soon that's a really good question uh, from Ryan. Uh, quick answer is that usually when you get small hail initially, usually you're going to see the biggest hail initially with the storm. So if you're getting small hail initially, it's unlikely that it can happen that you will. That's probably the biggest hail you'll end up seeing. So oh, that's good to know. OK, a, a reason being is just that warmer air can hold more moisture after you get a storm. It cools down, so it makes it less, but not impossible, but less likely to get a big hail storm after. There you go. You got the answer directly from the horse's mouth. Pardon me, not the horse, <laughs> the crispy donkey. Thank you, crispy donkey. Some of Colorado's 14ers got a lot more popular during the pandemic. 2020 was a record year for traffic on our state's highest peaks. Now local governments are trying to reduce the crowds, and there are outdoors groups worried that hikers will get pushed out. The Colorado 14ers Initiative tracks annual foot traffic on Colorado's highest mountains. 2020 was a record 215,000 hikers on 14ers. That number has been declining since from, from 415,000 to 279,000 last year. The 14ers initiative says that local land managers and law enforcement were just overwhelmed by hikers during the pandemic. And now they've put in more trail restrictions, tougher parking rules at some of the more accessible peaks along the front range. The advocates say that's not a bad thing, but it might push people to less regulated trails.
the reduction in hiking use obviously might mean that we have um, less impacts to the to the fragile alpine uh, ecosystems. Um, unfortunately, you know, if, if we've got fees and reservations and things, it might be pushing people elsewhere. Uh, it might be pushing them to places where we don't actually have um, proper infrastructure. 14ers Initiative says they're in the process of helping local governments fix some of the issues that have arisen, like lack of parking and human waste disposal. Full disclosure on this, that nonprofit, the 14ers Initiative, was one of the very first recipients of your Word of Thanks microgiving campaigns three years ago. It's not necessarily that they'll be good. It's more or less the, the discipline factor, what we're looking at. They're not trying to find the next Floyd Mayweather. It's just about helping kids find a passion and a way to stay out of trouble. That's next. Great Workout is an amazing stress reliever, and a nonprofit called Lifeline Colorado thinks it could be a literal lifesaver for at risk kids. Separate it in three. Okay. One, two, three. Shift your. Perfect, yeah. My name is Steve Messes. Um, I'm a boxing trainer here at the House of Pain Gym. Um, I'm also an employee with Lifeline. So at Lifeline, I work with, uh, with the violence interruption team. It's when we go and we tell kids, like, hey, you know what? Like, you know, there's other ways, you know what I mean? And once you tell them, hey, we also have a boxing gym, their eyes just light up. This kid came to us and wanted to stay out of trouble. That was his thing. He just came to my coach, Donald, and said, I just don't want to get in trouble. I'm doing boxing just to really self-improve and just start a career maybe for myself. And I didn't join any specific reason, just really just keep me out of trouble, keep myself motivated and be a better person than I ever was. I've only done this for about six, seven months, so not long. And I had my first fight this Saturday. It starts a movement in. Everybody, you know, sees one kid doing good, they all want to do good. You know, I mean, you know, you build leaders by doing this. We figure out a way, we don't turn kids down. You know, if there's kids that can't afford it, you know, we'll figure out a way. All my coaches are volunteers, every single one of them. I grew up in a very rough neighborhood. I've seen what the streets can do to kids. I see, I still, have trouble comprehending what happened when I was younger. So I don't want them, I don't want any kid to go through what I went through. Elijah's a great experience. I asked him, what do you want from this? He goes, I want to stay out of the streets. I don't want to get into the gang life. He, he's like one of the guys I look up to. Like my coach said, he wants to help us out, not learn from his mistakes and everything. You want to fight, you know, come on into the boxing gym, you know, just try to keep them active right here. You know, try to get them in any kind of program that we can. Your feedback suggests that some of you are seeing red tonight and think I should check myself. I would point out this is technically a window pane. That's next. Yeah, a chatty bunch tonight. Man, a bunch of you send feedback. Casa writes that... Uh, Chris Bianchi is never going to be called by his real name again. No, from now on, he is simply Crispy Donkey. Shanna says, thank you, Crispy Donkey, and the rest of the Nine News crew for the great weather coverage. Yeah, Crispy Donkey has been working his tail off, uh, so to speak, the last couple of weeks. It's been busy, and they've done great work. All right, what do we got here? Brian, the good. Well, this is good. Okay, the good, reporting on water issues. The less good, Kyle's jacket made me long for the era of black and white television. Jeff writes, when you wear a jacket like that, you need to talk a bit louder so that we can hear you. That's funny. I like that. That's good. Hey, have a happy and safe fourth. See you back here tomorrow.